So we are starting the uh, reporting on the various uh, workshops. Uh, I have uh, to uh, say that we had an extremely rich and uh, uh, very, very uh, comprehensive uh, uh, discussion on the world economic outlook and all what goes with it and global finance. I, uh, we had uh, an exceptionally, uh, I would say, a uh, remarkable uh, set of, uh, of uh, experiences and uh, of uh, uh, competence and skills and, and, uh, and wisdom. So uh, let me only mention that we had participating in this workshop uh, uh, Raed Sharafeddin, uh, first gov vice governor of Bank du Liban, Daniel Dayanou, professor of economics and former minister of finance of uh, Romania, Ur Kyungwuk, former Vice Minister of Strategy and Finance and Ambassador of Korea to OECD, Kyoto Ido, Vice Chairman of the Institute for International Economic Studies in Tokyo and former Executive Director of Bank of Japan, André Lévy-Long, Chairman of Les Eco and Vice Chairman of uh, Rothschild, former Chairman and CEO of uh, Paribas, and John Lipsky, uh, Senior Fellow in John Hopkins, he spoke already, recently a uh, former first deputy managing director of the IMF. So as you see, a multi-ocular uh, multi vision, if I may, uh, with a lot of uh, uh, dimensions. Uh, so as regards the world economic outlook, let me say that uh, there was the remark that we had a disappointing subdued growth uh, this year, that uh, it was uh, the mark of the time, of the post-crisis time, uh, there was a lot of uh, discussion to try to understand better what was behind. Uh, was it uh, demographics? Yes, it is demographics uh, for, uh, for uh, a good part of uh, what we are observing as regards this mediocre growth. I would say both in the advanced economy, undoubtedly, and also in some emerging economies. The poor level of investment was very much uh, quoted as one of the reasons why the growth was so mediocre, very uh, abnormal level of investment, of course, uh, is not uh, paving the way for, uh, for growth and for labor productivity progress because the stock of capital is not what it should be. And uh, there was also the uh, remark that uh, uh, total factor of productivity, TFP, on top of mediocre demographics and insufficient investment in capital was also there to uh, explain uh, the, uh, the fact that we were, uh, again, in a situation where growth was mediocre. And then we try to understand a little bit what was behind the conundrum, uh, what was behind this uh, uh, TFP mediocre growth. Several explanations were, uh, were given. Uh, one was that we had to be patient and that uh, we have waves of productivity as we had wave of, uh, in, the, in the long-term cycle of, uh, of economics, uh, Kondratyev cycle was uh, quoted, and uh, that was perhaps the same phenomenon that we had when we were waiting for the uh, productivity uh, impact of the investment in uh, computers. Uh, during a long period, there was absolutely no uh, translation of this investment in, uh, in productivity. And then it came, but it came late uh, in 95. The, the, the jump of uh, productivity was observed in, in 95 after a long period from 73 to 95 of uh, TFP at 0.5% uh, growth. And then it jumped at 2% growth. Uh, we, are, we were back to 0.5 and perhaps it, it was the effect, the, of the, the lagged effect of the fact that the new IT uh, revolution is not yet uh, uh, producing what we are expecting. Uh, the, uh, there was also the mention that at a global level, when we were looking at global growth and uh, a global uh, disappointing growth, perhaps we, it was the, uh, the fact that we were at the end of the transition of the communist country, which had brought about a lot of uh, skilled labor relatively skilled labor to the global economy 
uh, with, which was producing uh, uh, a jump in, uh, in growth uh, and in productivity because, because they were plunged in a different universe where the capacity to, uh, to augment growth, uh, augment productivity was more, more clear. Uh, we did not discuss much the problem of measurement. I mentioned it nevertheless uh, because one of us mentioned it, uh, the fact that uh, perhaps we are under assessing in the present period the real growth uh, because we, uh, digitalization has, uh, is very difficult to measure. So I don't insist on that. I take it that uh, academia generally considers that it is unlikely that uh, digitalization is uh, hiding in a, a real growth which would be much more flattering than what we are observing. The poor education and training or the insufficient education and training, particularly in the advanced economy, mass education in the advanced economy was also mentioned as part of our problem. And of course, this is certainly part of, uh, of the structural reforms which uh, are considered by uh, the working uh, party uh, as uh, overdue in most economy, if not all economy. And amongst the general remark I have to make, precisely structural reforms, education and training, mass education as well as uh, excellent education, education of excellence uh, was considered a, a big, a big issue. And in many countries, uh, labor market flexibility, markets of goods and services, uh, uh, and uh, the old what uh, foster uh, innovation, creativity, and uh, the generalization of uh, IT and digitalization was part of what we, we was part of the structural reforms that were needed. There was the, re the general remark that uh, we benefited in the crisis. We advanced economy from an emerging market resilience, which had been absolutely remarkable in the crisis. Uh, there was uh, many remarks uh, also that were more, I would say, uh, drawn from particular experience. Uh, we had a very, very interesting remarks on abenomics and uh, the problematics of, of abenomics uh, by uh, Kyoto Ido. We had um, the uh, 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 remarkable exposition on Korea and on the specific uh, uh, problems and issues at stake, the new engines of growth for, for Korea and uh, uh, the, uh, all what goes with uh, an economy which, is, you know, which has been growing so rapidly that it is now really one of the advanced economy, but with all the problems that are associated with this extremely rapid growth. We had interesting uh, remarks also on the example of Lebanon, where uh, the resilience of Lebanon in many abominable crises was uh, uh, stressed. And also, I have to say that it triggered uh, uh, some discussion, the problem of immigration, the figures being in uh, Lebanon absolutely incredible because if I'm not misled, and I will be correct by Governor Sharafeddin, but uh, the four million Lebanese had to uh, welcome two million more people coming from Syria and uh, the neighboring countries. And the idea that it was <laughs> possible to absorb 50% of your own population in a very short span of time was, again, as I said, uh, stunning. Uh, the members of, of the group and uh, three questions. Of course, we considered that the political element, we, namely uh, the, the Brexit phenomenon, the uh, Trump uh, election, which was, uh, in the opinion of many, due to frustration expressed by many in the advanced economies on uh, the rapidity of changes, the rapidity of the restructuring uh, that was uh, uh, triggered by uh, the emergence of, the, of, of India, China, Brazil, Mexico, uh, the, also the uh, science and technology surge, the IT and digitalization was putting into question the skills, the jobs, uh, the, uh, I would say, uh, stability of, uh, of their uh, place in the productive sector, 
of many in, in all economies, by the way, and particularly in the advanced economy that had the monopoly of many production before, and the idea that uh, the main political problem uh, that we had uh, in the advanced economy was clearly coming out of this uh, sentiment of frustration, but the fact that it had an impact on uh, global growth because uh, the call for, uh, for um, uh, I would say, more protectionism or less uh, advances in uh, opening trade had, of course, uh, the consequence of slowing down the process of, uh, of growth, but it was part of the message coming from uh, this uh, population, this member, or these fellow citizens for, from, uh, in, in the advanced economy. So again, a, an immense problem on which uh, we clearly have to reflect uh, much more. Uh, I, I will stop there because the time has been limited. I uh, go, if you permit, to global finance for uh, very rapidly. There we had uh, a very interesting uh, exchange of views. Uh, I will only mention the fact that uh, uh, we had uh, main messages uh, uh, that, were, uh, that we were probably middle of the road in terms of uh, both, I would say, uh, uh, drawing the right regulation, the, the right credentials in all domains, with uh, uh, probably a lot of hard work to, to continue to do, particularly in the non-bank sector. The banks sector has having been very, very heavily examined by uh, the international authorities, the FSB and uh, the Basel Committee and the G20 and so forth. Uh, but uh, I will, if you permit, concentrate more on the dangers that we identified, uh, the difficulty that uh, should be uh, in our mind. The idea that over-regulation was a danger where we, we had to be cautious because we could, in over-regulating, do perhaps more than what was required by financial stability and hamper the recovery uh, in all economies of the world, uh, and uh, particularly in the uh, advanced economies. Uh, we. Uh, uh, mentioned uh, the bailing in concept, which uh, was uh, considered uh, something which was certainly uh, uh, welcome in terms of uh, a steady state of uh, global finance when we have eliminated all systemic risk. But that, of course, if systemic risk were uh, still there, uh, it, we had to be uh, cautious as regards the, the systemic implementation of bailing in. Uh, again, that, that is a question mark, that is not a conclusion of the group. We, uh, we had a call for uh, uh, combating the instability of the regulatory environment, and in this respect, of course, uh, friends uh, uh, of the US, and uh, in particular, uh, John Lipsky, which was there, was, was saying that it, it could create a problem if Dodd-Frank was uh, eliminated, uh, as perhaps it will, will be the case. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that I am not, uh, uh, I'm correctly passing the message of the, of the group if I say that the idea that uh, in any case the US should protect what has been a global consensus, uh, if it was possible, of course, to change uh, drastically, perhaps, uh, some of the rules and regulations that were specific for the United States uh, and uh, were taken by the previous administration. Uh, a very important remark was made by, I think, uh, André Lévy-Lang on uh, equity, the necessity to insist on long-term financing and equity uh, uh, as uh, uh, absolutely necessary for financial stability. I have to say that I share very much that view personally because I think that in insisting too much on, uh, on augmenting uh, debt, we are taking a risk. And the idea that uh, the unintended effect of some of the regulation was precisely to, um, to uh, hamper equity and equity formation and also to hamper liquidity 
the paradox being that uh, in uh, some domains, and particularly in, uh, in the equity uh, markets, you would have both uh, banks, uh, central banks, uh, being extra extremely active and uh, introducing a lot of liquidity when the liquidity that was observed on the de facto uh, functioning of some markets was very insufficient and probably perhaps due to unintended effects of uh, prudentials. I think I am at the end of the various ideas that we had, uh, uh, I would say, assessed. Uh, the banks, uh, Europe versus US uh, was mentioned, but I don't want to be too eloquent on that because we discussed that in a panel here. Uh, the uh, fintech, the startups that were uh, now flourishing uh, uh, everywhere we are mentioned as uh, very important, particularly for finance and global finance, because they are both, I would say, disruptive and also full of promise. Uh, and uh, what else? I think that, uh, that I am, I've covered, of course, the idea that we were finally uh, very bad in the crisis prevention as regards 07 or 08 crisis, that we were quite good in the handling of the crisis at a time which was totally dramatic. We avoided the total collapse of the system and uh, depression, but that we might be now not very good in preventing the next financial crisis, and uh, that was something that we, we should have in mind. So I'd stop there and ask for all the indulgence of the member of the, of the working party. Please. Good morning, uh, my name is Marie-Claire Aoun. I am the director of the Center for Energy at IFRI. Um, I will do my best to reflect on the discussions which were held yesterday during the workshop too on energy and climate. The workshop focused on the new era characterizing our energy markets today, as well as on the challenges and progress towards the decarbonization of energy systems to achieve the targets set in Paris in December last year. The workshop was chaired by Donald Johnston, former Secretary General of the OECD. We had also a distinguished panel of speakers. The panel was composed of Olivier Appert, Senior Advisor to the Center for Energy at IFRI, Tatsuo Masuda, Visiting Professor at the NUCB Graduate School, former Vice, Vice President of Japan National Oil Corporation, Daniela Lulace, CEO of Nuclear Electrica, Ladislas Baskiewicz, Senior Vice President, Strategy and Climate of Total, and finally, Lee Hai Min, who is the G20 Chairpa from Korea. So we started the workshop by highlighting that the oil market has actually entered a new era since 2014, an era of oversupply, with the development of the light tight oils in the US and the slowdown in the oil demand growth of China resulting in a dramatic drop of the oil prices. So all eyes are now turned towards OPEC, and the oil market is holding its breath until 13th of November, waiting for an action from OPEC to reduce its output. But there are still many uncertainties here. Will the reduction be enough to rebalance the market? Will Iran, Iraq, Russia agree to contribute to the effort? What will be the reaction of the U.S. Pro producers? And will the OPEC countries comply with their commitments on the long term? Beyond these immediate challenges, the oil market has also to deal with longer term challenges. While the peak oil supply threat was dominating the debates 10 years ago, today we are more talking about the peak oil demand, which will probably be the outcome of energy transition policies. But this will take time, as shown by several scenarios, notably those of the IEA, revealing that fossil fuels under our current policies, new policy scenarios, will still occupy 75% of our energy mix in 2040. So several participants agreed yesterday that despite the decreasing costs of renewable, the switch towards a decarbonized economy is slow and is taking time. 
It was mentioned that coal, the elephant in the room, will still be a significant part of the energy mixes of countries such as in China and also India in the near future, which means that we are very far from being on the right trajectory to achieve the two degrees target. Will technologies help us achieving our decarbonization targets? There is actually a wide range of technologies available today with different maturity levels. We talked yesterday about carbon capture storage and also about advanced power storage, which is key to mitigate the intermittency of renewable. We also talked about power electronics, electronics, which if installed could also help saving huge volumes of energy. We also talked about advanced nuclear reactors, which are smaller reactors, safer, and have an improved waste profile. But for all these technologies to materialize, the main obstacle remain the costs, and they need huge investments and financing. Some speakers stated also that it will not be possible to reach the two degrees target without nuclear. It is a stable and mature technology, and at the same time, a competitive and low carbon source of energy. But we need to, de to develop a different approach to nuclear energy today, taking into account one of the main obstacles, which is related to public acceptance. The discussions also confirmed yesterday the, the, the trend, however, uh, over uh, of a global progress towards a low carbon world. Comparing to 10 years ago, we have today much more initiatives coming from the private sector, such as the ones coming from the oil and gas company. So we talked yesterday about the case of Total, which is taking several actions to reduce its carbon footprint, focusing more on natural gas, as we have seen in the previous section, focusing on lowest cost oil projects, applying an internal CO2 price between $30 and $40 per tonne, limiting methane emissions, but also investing in renewable and even striking to be a leader in this sector. The oil and gas climate initiative gathering several oil and gas companies was also mentioned, which aims is to cooperate on finding solutions for climate change. On the international scene and beyond the Paris Agreement, there are also some political actions taken at the level of the G20 in this direction. The G20 has agreed to reduce another source of greenhouse gas emission, which are HFC emissions. Last October, the International Civil Aviation Organization has also adopted a resolution to reduce CO2 emissions in the airline industry, making it the first industry ever to adopt a global carbon market. But on the other hand, the progress towards ineff removing inefficient fossil fuel subsidies remains slow as the G20 discussion did not result in a commitment in, in order to eliminate these subsidies by 2025. It was mentioned yesterday that all these three issues were actively driven in the G20 by the U.S. leadership until now, and that there are doubts now on how progress can be further achieved in the future in the absence of this U.S. leadership. Finally, participants agreed that there is no easy path for, decarbonization, for the decarbonizing revolution. Beyond those political actions, the response to the climate challenge will actually have to come from the private sector, as the major obstacle to low-carbon transition is still financing. A participant from the industry concluded that to achieve the two degrees target and the scaling up of national commitments, we need to work on the clarification of the rules for the private sector. We need to continue working on, the pri on carbon pricing and potentially on the dis manage the distortions that it might create globally. These new rules will probably have an impact on global trade and potential bottlenecks under the World Tra Trade Organization should be identified. And this increasing role for the private sector, but also for the civil society and other non-state actors, was confirmed during COP22 in Marrakesh the last two weeks with several announcements uh, of initiatives and commitments in favor of decarbonization. Thank you very much for your attention. Good morning. Uh, I'm uh, Ingu Park. I'm the president of Korea Foundation for the Advanced Studies, uh, who, chair, who monitored uh, the session on uh, China in uh, transition. Uh, my uh, panel, uh, two Chinese uh, scholars participate, 
uh, and two American uh, uh, scholars, and one from Japan and one from Europe, and one, also one from uh, Korea. Uh, so if I introduce uh, them uh, uh, on uh, Park tae ho uh, former uh, trade minister, and uh, Richard, uh, Professor Richard Cooper from Harvard University, and uh, Michel uh, Fouché, who has uh, served as a uh, director for policy planning of the uh, French government, and Jia Jingguo uh, from uh, Beijing University, and Chao Ida, vice president uh, of Shanghai Development uh, Research Foundation, and uh, Yuichi uh, Hosoya uh, from Keio University, and also uh, Douglas Paul, uh, vice president of Carnegie uh, Endowment. Uh, we uh, have some uh, uh, discussion uh, on uh, China's uh, internal uh, situation uh, since last, uh, during the last one year. Uh, because, you know, the, uh, our uh, WPC has some first uh, session on China uh, uh, last uh, year. So we uh, try to check what uh, has uh, evolved during the last one year in the area of the political uh, arena and also uh, economic uh, uh, area. And then uh, you know, in the wake of the uh, US presidential election, uh, we tried uh, to, uh, uh, have, uh, to shed a light uh, on uh, Sino-American uh, uh, relationship. And also uh, uh, we have some uh, thought on the uh, current situation of the TPP uh, especially in the wake of the presidential election. And on Chinese side, uh, new, uh, the situation of uh, New Silk Road uh, initiative and also uh, North Korean nuclear issues, uh, recent development, and uh, Sino-Japan uh, uh, relationship, and also uh, uh, current uh, Taiwanese uh, issues. So, if I give some uh, uh, point, uh, you know, on uh, on, has, uh, on what has been uh, discussed, on first issues of the uh, Chinese, you know, internal issues on political issues, uh, the sixth uh, plenum uh, communique uh, of Communist uh, Party, uh, Chinese Communist Party, uh, in last uh, October, uh, specified uh, President Xi Jinping. Uh, as the core of the party leadership. Uh, our uh, debate uh, centered on the implication on uh, the meaning of the uh, core status. Um, and uh, the future of the Chinese uh, party uh, leadership uh, system. And the remaining uh, question uh, uh, was how the collective, uh, the current collective Chinese leadership will change or evolve in the 19th uh, Party uh, Congress to be held uh, the latter part uh, of next year. One scholar observed that uh, she, uh, President Xi's uh, leadership is being strengthened. Uh, being core means uh, having more influence. It means that uh, President Xi Jinping has the final say instead of uh, just one uh, uh, you know, vote among the seven standing uh, committee members up until now. On economic issues, uh, during the last November's fifth uh, plenum uh, of Communist Party, President uh, Xi mentioned that China's annual growth rate uh, should be no less than 6.5%. Uh, Fortunately, uh, during the last three uh, quarters, China achieved 6.7%. GDP uh, growth. When Chinese uh, scholars explain that China's uh, you know, economy's uh, structural uh, transition from export-oriented economy to domestic consumption-led uh, economy has uh, already begun uh, to uh, manifest. Uh, consumption's contribution uh, to GDP during the last three uh, quarters reached uh, as high as 71% and a uh, 13 uh, percent increase from uh, last uh, year. And uh, service industry's uh, contribution to GDP was uh, more than 57 percent in 2015. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, innovation-driven uh, economy uh, is also growing. But uh, there remains many uh, challenges, how to deepen structural uh, reform, how to prevent accumulation of the financial risk, how to carry internationalization of uh, RMB while keeping exchange rate and capital flow less fluctuated. One panelist pointed out uh, that the household consumption in China cannot be as high as 71% of GDP. He argued that that figures include uh, includes a public consumption such as health care, pension, and education. Regarding this uh, point, uh, the Chinese panelists uh, uh, countered that the household con uh, consumption accounts for about 40%. Uh, and admitted that it will take some time uh, for China to have more uh, you know, private uh, consumption uh, increase. Our audience uh, commented that to have a real uh, boost in consumption, the liberalization of credit is uh, needed, which would mean the losing power for uh, communist uh, uh, Chinese party uh, because credit is uh, uh, you know, their instrument of uh, policy. And uh, Lam Minbi, uh, you know, entered, uh, I mean, last October, uh, uh, Lam Minbi uh, entered IMF SDL uh, basket. But uh, while China's share of the global uh, trade is 16%, uh, the actual transaction in uh, Lam Minbi is a little more than only 1%. Uh, to make RMB more internationalized, it was suggested that uh, China should go through further domestic uh, financial reform or uh, liberalization and have more openness uh, in domestic market. International community is concerned about when the reform will start uh, in, uh, uh, in earnest. Uh, next issue was uh, uh, Sino-American uh, relationship. Uh, at this moment, uh, the, uh, the future of the Sino-American uh, relations is uncertain and unpredictable, especially in the wake of U.S. presidential election. The panelists agreed on the fact that the Paris Agreement, of Paris, uh, um, COP21 uh, Paris Environmental uh, Agreement was a monumental achievement uh, which was uh, achieved uh, through the collaboration uh, between U.S. and China. Uh, but uh, Mr. Uh, Trump has implied that U.S. could withdraw from the Paris Agreement. The one panelist uh, thought that uh, Mr. Trump would uh, not try to withdraw from it, but uh, just ignore uh, it. Uh, President-elect uh, uh, President Trump uh, has disavowed uh, his previous uh, remarks on several key international uh, issues. Uh, even though uh, Mr. Trump said many harsh things about trade with foreign countries, especially uh, China, um, including designating China as a currency manipulator, which got much support from the uh, campaign uh, uh, domestically. But one U.S. panelist uh, pointed out that the issue is uh, uh, not new, uh, more than 10 years old, and uh, not much relevant to the uh, present uh, time. His uh, other uh, declarations, such as imposing high uh, tariffs on uh, uh, or withdrawing from the uh, WTO, will not be easy to implement because the Chinese uh, protected by its membership in uh, within the uh, WTO and possible fierce resistance from even his own Republican Party. It was uh, mentioned that uh, uh, there are uh, some points uh, where uh, Trump's uh, policy will be uh, 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 favorable to China. Uh, first, um, as TPP is sometimes seen as anti-China coalition of agreement, the Trump's you know, the assertion to withdraw, to throw off the TPP might work favorably for China. Second, if the U.S. Uh, decides to nullify NAFTA, it will benefit China by uh, making Mexican goods uh, uh, less competitive. 
And um, on uh, President-elect uh, Trump's you know, implication of the possibility of the Japan and Korea's uh, going uh, nuclear, uh, despite uh, his uh, uh, recent uh, denials, uh, there has been uh, some residual uh, concern uh, of the cascade uh, or uh, chain uh, reaction of going uh, nuclear uh, in Northeast uh, Asia. Uh, one audience asks if uh, 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 Trump will try uh, different approaches to North Korea. Uh, an American uh, panelist gave uh, the past example. Uh, President Carter, who was elected in 1976, has pr uh, promised to end the alliance with uh, uh, South Korea because of human rights uh, violations during President Park Jong-hee. Uh, but Assistant Secretary uh, Richard Holbrook persuaded President Carter uh, not to withdraw uh, U.S. Uh, troops from uh, South Korea. Uh, similarly, uh, the panelists noted uh, the coming administration will uh, also be briefed by uh, the competent uh, foreign policy expert, uh, which will help uh, Mr. Trump uh, to have a more balanced view. On South China Sea issues, uh, last July, the permanent court of arbitration gave one side a uh, you know, victory to the Philippines. As a result, uh, the nine dash line uh, or U shaped uh, line's uh, legal base was seriously uh, challenged. Uh, Philippine President uh, Duterte announced uh, separation from uh, US, uh, however, and uh, the new uh, special relationship with uh, China. Uh, Madrid raised a question after Duterte's uh, assertion will other ASEAN uh, neighbors? Uh, follow suit. One panelist uh, uh, thought that uh, for now, the tension in the South uh, China Sea seems to be relatively stabilizing. And another panelist uh, uh, perceived uh, that the South uh, perceived the South uh, China Sea dispute as a contradiction between uh, China's global and uh, regional interest. On the question of uh, why China is not specifying the nine dish line. The one Chinese panelist explained as follows. Uh, China has uh, sovereignty over the territories uh, adjacent to it and uh, EEG, according to UNCLOS. But the Chinese government has never officially claimed that the waters within the nine dish line belong to China. He added that uh, even though China has been pushed to clarify the nine dish line, the timing is not so good for China because it, uh, uh, Chinese people are still quite emotional uh, about historical humiliation. To this, uh, one uh, panelist uh, counter argued that uh, the Chinese government is actually feeding the public sentiment of humiliation by public education. Uh, he emphasized that education policy on history is also foreign uh, policy. On the issue of TPP, uh, two weeks ago, uh, Obama administration acknowledged that it has no way forward. The virtually gave up TPP. The remaining question is, what, what's the future? Renegotiation or Nuremberg? Uh, since uh, Mr. Trump declared the end of uh, TPP, the prospect of uh, its being reselected is very low. But even if uh, US changes its position and decides to participate in the uh, TPP uh, process, it may take quite a long time to finish renegotiations and or uh, internal ratification process. Against uh, this backdrop, uh, however, uh, one panelist argued that the, uh, China's uh, position will figure more salient. China will be able to uh, play a leading role 
in other uh, regional trade negotiations such as RCEP, China, Japan, Korea, FTA, FTAP, or uh, TTIP uh, in the future. Uh, next issue uh, was on uh, New Silk Road, uh, in the name of the uh, uh, One Belt, One Road, and uh, it's a related uh, AIB uh, you know, uh, uh, establishment. Uh, this year, China uh, achieved a great success uh, in securing 100 billion uh, US dollars pledge uh, for the launching of the AIIB, including uh, India and Russia as second and uh, third largest participants in terms of uh, our, our money uh, uh, budget. But the total amount uh, accounts uh, for only uh, one-tenth of uh, the total budget needed uh, for uh, completion of the uh, One Belt, One Load project. How will China uh, bridge the gap? One panelist said, the tension between China and the other players in the uh, South uh, China Sea complicated efforts uh, to push forward the One Belt, One Load initiative. Uh, regarding top, uh, 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 Regarding top uh, Trump's advisor's comment that uh, not joining AIB was a strategic mistake of Obama administration. Uh, in this regard, one U.S. panelist agreed to, uh, to such you know, the point. Uh, he specified uh, Asia Development Bank, uh, Bank uh, or ADB, as a good uh, example, uh, which was created uh, in 1960s uh, to engage uh, Japan uh, in, a wide, uh, in a wider world uh, role, and it was very successful. Uh, he added that now uh, U.S. Congress has a Republican president. Uh, there might be uh, some hope that uh, the Republican Congress uh, will be more receptive uh, to it uh, if Trump, uh, President Trump decides to join AIIB. It was also pointed out that uh, One Belt, One Node initiative uh, will be a key element of internationalization of uh, uh, Lumbin B, but one hardly exists, uh, which is the security challenges. The many Central Asian and the Middle Eastern countries uh, along uh, the road uh, uh, through the uh, one Belt, One Road are politically uh, unstable. Uh, and uh, North Korea nuclear issues. Our panelists uh, are of the opinion that the North Korean nuclear issues uh, will be really uh, one of the, uh, the, uh, the biggest you know, headache uh, in the years uh, to come for the next U.S. administration. Uh, this week, uh, UN, uh, additional uh, UN Security Council um, sanctional uh, resolution uh, is expected to be adopted. The main focus will be uh, closing uh, the livelihood uh, loopholes, uh, including the shipment of North Korean coal to China, uh, given the fact uh, that last year almost 60% increase of uh, coal uh, you know, price. President-elect uh, Trump has uh, driven uh, North, Korea, North Korean nuclear problems to China's inaction and said uh, that the solution will be also uh, through China. If I quote what he said, uh, North, uh, North Korean nuke problem is through China. Because of China, everything is China, unquote. Uh, if China's, uh, China wouldn't uh, fundamentally change its uh, current position of prioritizing uh, peace and security of Korean Peninsula over denuclearization, uh, the North, uh, North Korean uh, nuclear issue will be more complicated uh, in the coming uh, years. It was also pointed out that uh, if nuclear freeze becomes the starting point uh, for uh, future negotiation uh, with North Korea, instead of denuclearization of the uh, uh, of until now, uh, uh, North Korea might uh, have some misunderstanding uh, that it virtually got de facto nuclear uh, state, uh, status, which might trigger chain reaction of going nuclear in Northeast Asia. 
It was added that North Korea's missile program is also a very uh, big concern that should not be, that should not be uh, disregarded. On the uh, uh, Sino-Japanese relations, um, uh, in the East China Sea, not South China Sea, the tensions are still uh, there, but both uh, President Xi and uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe managed to keep uh, the flame uh, low. One Japanese panelist uh, uh, viewed that, uh, that uh, uh, even though Prime Minister Abe was uh, often uh, portrayed as a dangerous or revisionist uh, figures, um, but uh, Japan's uh, under, uh, Prime Minister Abe managed to have stable uh, Sino-Japanese relations through pragmatic uh, approaches. As examples, during the, uh, two, uh, his 2006 and 7 term, uh, Prime Minister Abe played a key role in improving ties with uh, China. Uh, after he uh, uh, took his office, he visited uh, China first before visiting the United States and also established mutually beneficial okay, uh, uh, relationship based on uh, common strategic uh, uh, you know, interest. I have, uh, 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 last but not least, I have uh, the remaining very important issue, that is Taiwan issues, but given the time constraints, I have made full stop here. Thank you.